very much, Hannah. And a big thank you to you and the wider team for providing rich film. And I think congratulations to all the placemakers for providing such strong quality, clear video work to help tell the story. That's um, really, really impressive output from everyone. So as Hannah hinted, um, we'd love to hear your questions. I've seen there are some comments and questions that have been coming in, but we're now opening out into a panel discussion. Um, at the start of this, I just want to introduce uh, someone who has joined us from the panel from who, who didn't introduce at the beginning, uh, which was Deirdre McKenna from Cultural Documents. So you may want to say a quick hello and, and, and your role in the project. Yes, um, so I've been involved um, from an evaluation point of view, uh, meeting everybody uh, involved in all the different projects and, and seeing how it's kind of fermented to borrow from Danungo's pop. Um, and uh, and it's, just, it's just been a really, really inspiring process. And I think within all of that um, originality and creativity, this sort of clarity of, of the method is coming through uh, in the conditions of working in Argyll and Butte. So um, I think the document that Michael was introducing at the beginning um, has lots of incredibly valuable information and insights uh, and it would be good if that could be used to kind of pass on the baton and find out, uh, stimulate feedback for everybody. Great, thank you very much, Deirdre. Um, so, as I say, I'm going to go to the questions now, invite all our panellists onto camera um, as the questions come, because I think some can spread across and some have got direct sort of reference. So, first one, I just want to question champion Arlene Cullum, thank you very much. Um, was following the Eco Creatives Cluster project, um, wonderful project. What was the main ingredient that made it successful, do you think? And is there anything you would change about what you did? So that's just a no go and Deborah. Hi. Um, I think it's quite difficult for us to comment on what we felt was the main ingredient that made it successful. Um, I think certainly the, the the support and the esteem that the Rockfield Centre has already in the local community had a big part in it. Um, what would we what would we change or what would we have changed? I think nobody wanted a pandemic. Um, it certainly in, had an impact in that it made, meant we had to start very late on the process of the physical gardening process and creation of the garden and obviously gardening is a seasonal thing so that wasn't a great thing on the other hand it did make us do things differently and perhaps the way in which we had the artist conversations and the global reach of those would not have been the same had we not had the pandemic and not been if you like forced onto an on online forum um I think I think those are the, the that's the kind of main thing really. We we like to have not had the pandemic, but it did push us in in that particular direction, and, and from that point of view, it was an advantage. Great, and I might invite Eleanor actually um, representing Rockfield. If there's anything on those questions to respond to, I think really for me it was um, we had to kind of turn it on its head again because of the pandemic. We had to turn it on its head. Our plan was we're going to do the physical bits first and then and then do the webinar so we had to kind of flip it around which actually worked really well in the end because it gave us an awful lot more tools to work with when we actually got plants in the ground ourselves so um it was challenging and it, i think the timelines were challenging but i think um a lot of the skills that we had developed ourselves through the um lockdowns our, our own staff team so having fee on hand to have the skills to do the zooms early on was just a bonus um, and it just made made that little bit of difference but i think really to be honest the stars of the show are deborah and Nilko because they're the ones that pulled it together they would just come and ask me can we do x can we do y and we would generally say yes that's exactly what i was going to add that i think the, the two main assets that we had were deborah and elko to help <laughs> us get through it so we could add the other supports we had a venue that was central and open that people um trusted and that was growing within the community but without their sort of their ideas and their determination um, and it meant that when when we had in volunteers getting involved 
they they got excited because of how excited Deborah and Nelko were and that that spread it's contagious isn't it so suddenly we thought okay they're going to come and do the garden on a Friday and then they were there Friday Saturday Sunday Monday and you couldn't you couldn't get rid of them they were always there whenever we were there they were out if it was sunny and then if it wasn't sunny they were organizing zooms and seminars and sending emails so yeah Wonderful. And I imagine having seen the transformation on the site and what great job everyone has done, a really well designed garden as well, there must be a real sense of ownership and commitment to, to where it goes next and how it goes forward. So great stuff. Thank you. Um, so I'll move on to Arlene's next question, which I feel is for Saw Collective. Um, superb and lots of fun. How much did you benefit from having a new way of collaborating through slow interaction? Does it sit well alongside online collaborations, such as what happened with the microcluster development? Interesting question. Mm, that is an interesting question. And I think, um, I don't know if this is an interesting answer, but <laughs> I think that actually that's how collaboration works anyway. So by actually paying attention to the fact that it needs to be slow to, to gain the trust and the respect and, Kind of go through that process of mutual transformation together um so obviously we collaborated as a three but then in a sense we collaborated with our community to learn the pace that we needed to go at and i think actually when we were putting the slideshow together we realized how much we had done mm -hmm. and we were like whoa oh my god i can't fit this all in like this kind of format but i, I think it's amazing but it shows I mean, we demonstrated that some things didn't work, like the postcard thing at the very beginning just had no uptake and that we were jumping right in. And again, we that we couldn't communicate with them um, partly to do with the pandemic, but actually because we had so much to learn here first that we didn't connect with Isla or Colincy um, communities. But then, but then out of all of that, we learned to, or we got in touch with Jen and Jack at Argyle, Screen Argyle. So... I don't know. I feel like it was it was going that was just the way it was always going to be. Um and it was kind of about learning to really respect. Yeah. Respect and learn the pace that other people are going at. Um do and you I guys think, add Yeah, I think in terms of like the uh, the physical collaboration like using our tool, our Dropbox, like something that hands-on I think for us the in-person stuff always works the best and like it was something that encouraged us to actually make stuff and like personally I was in a creative rut so it encouraged things to happen physically that you wouldn't normally try and then I think like things like um, digital collaboration and communication that's really good for us for expanding our network like it's been really good um, going through the process with Michael and you know connecting to other people through online networks but I think proven by our DeLorean workshop where we didn't have many local people come to it but we had people who were visitors from the island and they connected to us through social media so it's good for maybe visitors and for people of other places but like I said you know we're figuring out the best communication for what audience we're trying to get to and I think for our local audience the it seems that like person to person stuff is more successful like there's a bit on Facebook but um, it seems to just kind of, it's not as good. They they really respond better to us. Yeah. Than <laughs> I, well, I guess it's, it's looking at the relationships that we each yeah. have to people in our community and really, really um, paying attention to that and, um, and not trying to be something we're not either. Mm. I think also um, the, we were definitely um, playing with, uh, remodeling a what is you know increasingly a familiar kind of digital technology and reimagining it as an old technology which of course is what the digital technology is anyway um, but um, we were we were playing with the, there, there's a there was a sense of play about taking something that make, that's intended to make things move really quick and keep everybody on their toes and be lightning fast and 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 and, and kind of um, super 21st century and and just going um, back to um, imagining it at a kind of more 
um, human speed. And also, and I'm sure Amy and Jeannie will agree with this, we've got people that we want to reach out to in our community who still don't have the computer and the internet and are very, very unlikely to, to, to become users um, of, of computers and, and the internet. And so we were, we were just kind of pegging down our um, ways of doing things. And also for the three of us, that mode of communication um, speaks to us with our different backgrounds as well. So it was very interesting. And then, and then just referring to your point, Arlene, about how that then speaks to this microclusters thing. Um, well, I'm, I don't know. I, we enjoyed sending, you know, getting things in the post from Argyle Roasters and, and from Domingo's Pop and just doing things that way in order to have some kind of collaboration with them. That was, that was a great thing to do. And it, you know, and it all harked back to things that we'd watched during the edge of the world with the St. Kilda mail, with the kind of mail boat things and stuff like that. So we realized that we were, we were just part of a way that, that, that it's still a valid way to do things. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and just to read out a few of the comments that followed, so Deirdre's comment of how courageous it was to put yourself forward as artists into the flow of your community. Some great role modeling. And I think the reflections and honesty and, and, and um, personality you've given to your presentation kind of reflects that as well, thank you. Um, Chris Wilde acknowledges wonderful and great dinosaur herd. It was very artfully put together. I was, I was jealous. It was really good. <laughs> Um, Arlene, bit of a nod to Stanley Kubrick there. Um, I'm wondering if there's a particular scene she's referring to. It. <laughs> Shall I have to just, yeah. <laughs> um, and James says, oh, sorry, this was a comment to um, Hannah regarding the sort of videos on Danuko's Pop. So James was saying the style of the documentary has great potential for a TV documentary, so the wider story of the project as well. And I would agree. Um, that that would be of interest to folk and could be a good way to get funding um, to develop it even further. Um, if you've got any suggestions or connections, James, please pass them on. Um, Arlene to do those pop, such a great idea, and I'd love to taste some. What's the main thing that has contributed to the success again, and what's the timeline like for the next steps you were mentioning? Um, so I think next steps are as I think we alluded to in the film, is that we need a space to produce safely in. Um, one of the hard things has been doing taste tests, actually, um, especially because just, you know, there's lots of issues around tasting things during a pandemic. Um, but, you know, we've overcome some of that. Um, and we also want to, all of the characters, we want to link to, like, organisations that deal with heritage here. And there's a bit more work to do around just forming those partnerships. Again, it's been really sort of hard during the pandemic to actually get in touch with people and so all the time although that started to, to sort of become easier now it's just been time um, it's been very time consuming stuff um, that kind of relationship building um, so the next steps are really to do that check in with people to make sure they're happy with how we're representing characters as well so the exhibition hopefully will get some feedback um, on that and then really it's about planning and fundraising and um, we've got a space to put a kitchen in but um, we need to sort of get some investment into that um, and uh, to do that properly. Um, and we somehow want to figure out how to, if there's a business model in, we want it to cover its cost basically. And I think that the combination of offering tools and um, producing goods and doing that and do it, there's, there's multiple streams of income, but it's actually, it's, it's how we get off the ground. Um, all the people involved in the project are all, have all got sort of quite, well, are all in practice, if you like. Um, so we're fitting this stuff in and the research around it in between projects uh, as well. So we want to sort of somehow figure out how to get development time properly um, to do it. Um, so yeah, they're, they're the sort of vaguely the next steps. Um, and yeah, we, we're sort of fairly confident that, <laughs> that at some point in the future, you will be able to buy stuff from us. Um, and if you are happen to be in Danoon, anyone, um, I happen to have a fridge full of syrups because um, we did have an opening. Um, so, and I can decant stuff into small sample bottles. So, um, yeah, please um, let me know. Julie noted. 
one little top up question, are there particular funding options or sources that you feel are the more appropriate that you're targeting or is it still open to conversations? Uh, I think, well, I think we need to look at structure. Um, so we're looking to set up probably a kick to, to, to sort of act as a, a sort of the, 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 to take the project forward through um and yeah there's various sort of um bits of funding that we can look at uh, as a startup sort of business um but i think it's the quote because of what because of the type of thing we're looking at um so we've got a sort of enterprise startup but we've also got ongoing research that we do want to continue around the heritage um there's a lot of work to, to turn this stuff into really good experience tourism or a visitor experience i think there's a lot of work to do there still uh, and a lot of things to produce that uh, would potentially give give someone a really interesting experience of, of place. We've, we've got this idea of doing tours that use the people characters and take you for a tour of the town and take you to the George Strewing factory and stuff. So we've just got some more thinking to do around how that would actually work. We've got the bones of something, definitely, um, um, and stuff. And now we've got actually drawings as well, visuals and stuff. Um, that really helps as well because you've got something to sort of evidence <laughs> all this research that you've been doing. Um, you know, it culminates in some images, but actually, you know, that's that's the sort of nature of this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so in terms of funding, we're not 100% sure, but we're going to do some development work and hopefully get some funding to do that and then hopefully sort of progress to other things. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Hannah. Cheers. Um, just going through more of the comments, Deirdre was saying, great to see such unique and well-considered work. I think that was applying across the board. And from, from Lindsay Sherrod, great to see so many approaches to engagement, which I think is a really valid point, not just across the projects, but within individual projects, there was multiple forms of engagement, so really rich work and approaches and practice going on. Nina, to Danunko's Bob was saying, really enjoyed hearing about Bob and wondered if you already know these folk. So there's a link to company drinks. And Kathleen O'Neill, Director of Charts, the outcomes of the discussions feedback from the webinar series in which most, if not all of these placemakers engaged contributed to the connections and development thereafter across the projects eventually commissioned that we've heard from today. So thanks for that insight as well. Um, and Deirdre, as artists, how would you say that the microcluster placemaker program has affected your sense of agency? So a nice reflective question that I'll probably finish on and then we'll hand over to Joe for final remarks. So across everyone, how has the microcluster placemaker program affected your sense of agency? We'll go to Nelko and Deborah first, please. Just to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, I don't. That's that's a quite a difficult question to answer, actually, without any time to really reflect on it. I mean, I guess it has made us both a bit more visible within the community, mm. um, literally in a physical sense, that people keep walking past and thinking, "Why is she watering that garden when it's actually <laughs> raining?" Things like that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think. You know, every, every piece of work you do, particularly every piece of work you do in the public eye, obviously it's a, it's a thing that builds confidence. You engage in conversation with people, whether it is just that, well, I'm watering this because actually the ground's very dry and I want to plant plants in it tomorrow, or you know, a bit more in depth about the nature of the project and particularly the network building um, does make you reflect and every, every, everything has you know, small incremental changes on the way you think about your own practice. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, as a curator, I think my role has this, this agent, you know, like connecting different things. That is um, what I do anyway. But um, when we started this project, I was well, still reasonably new to the area. So, uh, as Deborah mentioned, um, I think, I hope that in, in Auburn, people know about me a little bit more now. Um, some people got um, confused that I'm, I'm like an officer at um, the Lockfield Center or, yeah, <laughs> that, that kind of misunderstanding happens. But that means that the people recognize um, what we are doing. So um, that's good. Um, yeah, it's 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 great way to embed 
ourselves as a practitioner in the community and kind of understanding about the, the area by doing things or making things. I think that having making something tangible together, that is, um, as Nanako Suzuki, um, one of the practitioners mentioned, but, um, having a making as a kind of agent connect people that is a quite fun way to um, connect to people but also has um, yeah um, start start the interesting conversations around it what kind of material we use or where this comes from or how this color came from and um, where this color came from and things like that so yeah yeah when we had the Tatakizomi banner on display, as part of an open studio event recently, and people who had a hand in making it, or who had a hand in making panels for it, went back and saw the whole thing, because really, we were the, we're the only ones that had seen it in, as a single piece. Um, that, that was a nice moment. People actually saw where their panel was, how it looked in relation to the other panels. I think, I think from us um, as well with all the artists that was involved, I think one of the things that, that evolved is it, it all started with a conversation and it was the conversations that kept it going. And I think that's the bit that was really important for us that, you know, it's widened the network because being involved in it, um, the artists have all met all the other artists in the area. And it just, I think it's about the conversations that kept going. And I, I think it was maybe Amy that talked about the face-to-face that's very much an argyle thing, and I think that's really important that getting the face to face. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Um, on to Saw Collective, reflecting on agency. Um, so I think uh, just uh, probably one of the things for us is that um, the Microclusters project gave us the opportunity to actually establish ourselves as um, to kind of take the step to establish ourselves as a as a business. Um, and like, you know, not sure how I feel about this, but there is a certain validation that you get from going through the process that one went through to 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 then be awarded a grant to continue with with what we've done here. Um, that sort of then gives you enough, possibly gives you the bottle to go and set yourselves up 